Hello and welcome to um, the latest of the Monday Night Lecture series. This is a discussion of different aspects of volcanic hazards and some things we've more or less recently learned and some classic things we know about volcanic hazards from a range of sciences. My name is Simon Blockley. I'm a physical geographer in the department and I work on a range of things. I'm interested in climate change. I'm interested in human interaction with climate change. But one of the key tools that I use is the presence of volcanic ash layers in, in environmental deposits, in archaeological deposits, close to volcanoes. And I'm interested in how volcanoes interact with climate and volcanoes interact with humans. And so I want to touch on a few of these issues today and give you an overview of the kind of things you might um, find useful and interesting as extra add-ons at A-level, but also things you might expect to see um, as an overview and introduction to the kind of things we do in university courses on volcanic hazards. For example, our second year course on general hazards and our third year course on volcanoes. So today is particularly about hazards with a bit of a background on volcanoes. This is me in a slightly hazardous setting uh, quite a few years ago. I'm by the Sakurajima volcano on Kyushu, which is one the southern island in Japan. This is only a few kilometers away from Kagoshima city. And the volcano is constantly erupting, but in terms of its eruptions, normally it's small scale, uh, little ash eruptions like you can see behind you. But that plain that I'm stood on behind you is all pyroclastic flow material. So superheated um, particles of volcanic material that have poured down the mountain um, out of a collapsing um, eruptive column. That is a highly hazardous setting. So for those who are living on the island around Sakurajima, extremely hazardous. If an ash cloud were to um, collapse over the city of Kagoshima, a few kilometers away, there could be an extremely hazardous setting. And then also that volcano is surrounded by a water body. So there is a potential for tsunami hazards. So while this is a highly hazardous, potentially hazardous volcano and has erupted lethally several times, one of the things about volcanoes, particularly a volcano like this one, which is an, what we call an andesitic stratovolcano, is they don't ex erupt explosively very often, and therefore people have come to live near them. And this causes large issues for a number of volcanoes around the world where there's a reasonably large inhabitant population nearby. So we're going to touch on some of these kind of themes in this lecture tonight. So we're going to look first of all at kind of what makes volcanoes dangerous. Why do we get some particular kinds of volcanoes that have one style of hazard? Why do we get other volcanoes that exhibit another style of hazard or actually aren't particularly hazardous if you're careful and they're managed well? And that relates to their geographic position and their tectonic setting. So we'll briefly have a look at volcanoes of the world. Um, and then we'll just summarise the key volcanic hazards. I'm sure you've kind of heard of a lot of these in um, lectures you may have had at A-level or programmes you might be interested in, but we'll just set them up and then we're going to have some case studies. And two kinds of case studies, really, volcanoes and local hazards, and how we might think about mitigating them or finding out more about them and how risky they are. And then volcanoes and more distal hazards. So really, it's how volcanoes interact with the atmosphere. First of all, we have to think about volcanoes. Not every volcano is the same. In fact, you could argue that every single volcano is subtly different. But we can kind of start to classify volcanoes in terms of thinking about hazards by thinking, first of all, about their tectonic setting, what that means for the kind of eruptive behaviour you're going to get, because it's the eruptive behaviour that decides whether a volcano is particularly hazardous. And the tectonics is the first order that starts that. So we have our lithosphere. So we have a crust sitting on top of our lithosphere, and that's what we see, that's what we interact with. And we have all sorts of fissures and mountains and volcano, volcanic settings um, on the top of the lithosphere. But what's controlled the kinds of volcanic activity we see happens down here in the um, asthenosphere mainly, but down in the mantle and how it interacts with the lithosphere. So we have a, um, a solid mantle, but it's at such high pressures and such high temperatures that it's plastic. It behaves like a liquid over geological time. And one of the processes we get in, in this superheated mantle is convection. And that convection gives a rise to convection currents. And we start to get 
plumes of uh, mantle rising towards the asthenosphere, which is the upper part of the mantle, where it's most plastic and there's most deformation. And that can start to lead to partial melting. So you can start to get a liquid um, magma within there, and that will rise through effectively, very effectively, through the lithosphere and come out as hotspot volcanism. So one first form of classic volcanism, something like Hawaii, is hotspot volcanism. That tends to not be very explosively eruptive because that magma hasn't changed much chemically. So it tends to be quite liquid. Also in similar settings, in the oceanic setting, we might get something like this. So this is a spreading ridge where we have two tectonic plates moving apart. And that moving apart changes the pressure and again allows melting or partial melting of that, of that um, mantle material. That molten magma rises to the surface and again gives us largely um, fairly fluid magmatic material that tends not to lead to particularly explosive eruptions unless something else happens, as is in the case of Iceland, which is both on a spreading ridge, but is also a hotspot. As we move further away from, say, a spreading ridge centre towards where those same plates would then be subducting under another plate, we get more complex volcanism. So in an oceanic setting, we get a slab of material melting under the lithosphere. Again, you start to get partial melting of both slab material and also the mantle. That's more complex chemically, and you start to build up more viscous lavas. You get stratovolcanoes that have more viscosity, so they can form those classic cone-type stratovolcanoes. And that viscosity gives you more explosive eruptive behaviour. In a similar setting, but on a continental scale, so as opposed to an oceanic um, subducting plate, very, very similar processes. We also get more interaction with the continental crust. We get deformation of the continental crust, so we start to get rift zones. And we get a very complex volcanic setting. But again, generally, there's a potential for more uh, viscous magma, more mountain building, more stratovolcanoes, more explosive eruptive behaviour. So broadly, generally speaking, the um, tectonic setting controls a lot about the explosivity and the hazard. If we to look what that means globally about where the volcanoes that we are interested in are distributed, they're mostly distributed around those tectonic settings. So here is a destructive plate boundary or a transverse plate boundary. You've got two plates or more interacting with each other, some of it in a subductive sense, and you start to get a whole set of complex eruptive volcanoes that produce explosive eruptions periodically um, around the ring of fire, so the Pacific plate. You also have volcanic settings, for example, like hotspots, as I said, with Hawaii. You also have hotspots like Iceland that are hotspots, but also on subduction, sorry, in spreading ridges, so they've become very complex. Here's an example of hotspot volcanism in the continental plate of Eurasia. So this is the Eiffel region of Germany. That um, doesn't explode very often. It, last time it exploded was about 11,000 years ago, but it can be very explosive. That, there was an eruption 12 and a half thousand years ago there that spread ash all around the European continent. And then we have things like rift zones, where you get deformation of continental plates, such as the East African Risk Rift. They're also major centres for volcanism. These different tectonic settings and these different volcanic settings will give you different styles of eruption, and different types of hazard. So let's look in a bit more detail about volcanic hazards themselves as opposed to the volcanoes. So if you take the period from 1985 to the present, um, you can estimate volcano deaths at something like 25,000 people. The bulk of those are from one event, the Nevada del Ruiz eruption, or the, and it's also called the Amero disaster. Um, in South America, that killed the vast majority of those 25,000 people. That 25,000 is just over 1% of reported death tolls from all natural hazards in that time period. So just on the basis of those numbers, you might assume that while dangerous, volcanoes are only a marginal uh, natural geohazard. However, it's more complex than that. 
and that's just the last few years. If you go back further in time, Tambora in 1815 had a death toll, um, and this is in terms of relatively close to the volcano, uh, of about 75,000 people from pyroclastic flows and tsunamis in particular. Um, think about somewhere like Tambora, so Indonesia now, you have a much higher population density. The, the risk of an eruption like that, uh, if it was a major eruption, is very, very high. Krakatoa killed over 30,000 people. And there are tens of thousands of eruptions with estimated death tolls in the last couple of hundred years with death tolls greater than a thousand people. Others have also argued that we're actually being a bit overcautious with how we think about death tolls in terms of volcanoes. And some people have argued that the climatic cooling that was induced by major eruptions, particularly major summer cooling and failures of harvest in the past, has killed many, many more thousands of people than just those basic figures that are related to the proximal eruptions. So volcanoes are potentially more hazardous than that and something that we certainly have to be aware of. And what certainly hasn't happened in the modern period is there hasn't been a major eruption that hasn't been well managed that's close to a conurbation, say somewhere like Naples with a half a million people in a risk zone. So what makes volcanoes more or less dangerous? Well, that is the type of the volcano. And specifically, it's the viscosity of the lava or whether there's water involved, which also increases the viscosity. And that makes it more explosive and therefore more dangerous. So if we go down the list, we're looking basically at increased viscosity and therefore increased hazard. So flood uh, plateau basalts are very, very liquid. Shield volcanoes are also fairly liquid. And these are settings where the uh, molten magma is very effectively being transferred to the surface and not changing much. As we go down this list and go through cinder cones and get into stratovolcanoes, we're now talking about more viscous lava, the kind of lava that can build those big cone volcanoes. When these volcanoes erupt, they can be highly explosive and therefore very, very dangerous. They also tend to explode, explode less often because the magma conduit is less effective. That brings people closer to them and it adds to that volcanic risk. And ending up down at the bottom with calderas, which are the collapsed remnants of very large composite volcanoes during a period of, of, of extreme explosivity. Collapsed calderas themselves can still be highly dangerous because you haven't necessarily changed anything about the, the, the nature of the, of the magma chamber. So risk tends to increase going down this list. And really, the main thing is the viscosity of the lava. What kind of hazards do we see proximally to a volcano then, particularly? So this is a schematic of a classic volcano. We have magma in a magma chamber somewhere down in the lithosphere. Don't think of it, and this is a simple diagram, don't think of it as a big cave full of, of molten magma. That is not what a magma chamber looks like. Think of it as layers of superheated slush puppies sitting down uh, deep underneath the volcano at reduced pressures and temperatures from the mantle, sitting there and evolving and changing chemically and interacting with the crust and changing chemically and potentially becoming more viscous. And for example, many of the Icelandic volcanoes, Katla is a great example, is more explosive when it has had longer residence time between eruptions. Now, once that magma has risen and degassed, it's the gas that drives it to the surface and so therefore more viscous, more explosive, all sorts of things can happen. So if you've got a simple central vent you have an eruption, explosive eruption coming out of that central vent, and you have an eruption cloud. That eruption cloud will um, degas as well, so you're also going to get things like uh, sulfuric acid and, uh, in the upper atmosphere as a product of that. And that eruption cloud produces tephra, so fine-grained volcanic ash, which is taken by the prevailing winds over large distances. This is in itself one hazard that we'll look at later. You can also get gas and acid rain washing out of those clouds that can cause significant damage to um, crops nearby. Some major impacts of places like Mount St. Helens was to do with acid rain on crops, amongst other things. You can also get pyroclastic flows coming out of this eruptive column. So often the column will collapse, or partly of the column will collapse as it loses energy. And then you have this high energy, very, very hot flow pyroclastic material, so lithics and glass, running at um, 
hundreds of kilometers an hour potentially down the side of the volcano and that's lethal to any individuals or communities that are within that zone and that's one of the most significant hazards you'll often get close to a volcano also you can get destabilization of muds or you can get melting of, of ice that's on top of the on top of the volcano often volcanoes the strato volcanoes will have permanent or semi-permanent ice that melting causes um, high-speed mud flows and those themselves can be extremely hazardous so i talked about uh, the nevada del ruiz disaster from Amero. the town of Amero was destroyed by a lahar that was following the river valleys away from the volcano obviously you can also get lava flows they are slower moving, but they're still a hazard, particularly to property, less so to life. Also, you can get volcanic domes building up. Once this process has all happened, you'll often get a volcanic dome building up after the, um, the main degassing has happened. Those volcanic domes themselves can become unstable and they can break up and also become a pyroclastic flow hazard. Sometimes not during eruption, sometimes during earthquake activities after an eruption, or sometimes in the early or during some phases of a, an eruptive phase. So um, several significant disasters have been caused by a lava dome collapsing as part of a much smaller eruption. So lots and lots of local hazards to be aware of. Let's go through a few examples and we start with the least hazardous um, and that's lava flows. So I say least hazardous, if you're caught in a lava, lava flow unawares, obviously they're highly lethal, but lava tends not to travel at particularly high speeds, um, even flowing down fairly steep sided um, strato volcanoes, for example. So generally, if they're well managed, um, they are a risk to property, but generally not too much of a risk to life. There are some variants on that. So, for example, this is the Helgelfell incident in 1973 from Iceland, where um, the volcanic and uh, um, earthquake activity over time in that region and the tectonic setting in that region has caused a series of faults to set up. And sometimes you can get fissure eruptions exploiting those faults. So a lot of the main volcanic centers off Iceland, um, not just Iceland, but it's a classic example, you have fissures irradiating away or, or faults irradiating away from the main volcanic center. Fissure eruptions can exploit that. In this particular case, a fissure eruption happened overnight in the middle of the town of Helgelfell. Now Icelanders being Icelanders are a hardy folk and what they did is what Icelanders would always do under this setting is they started spraying the whole thing with water. So you manage this particular kind of hazard by freezing it, building up a block so that a blockage so that future lava that is erupting is directed away from a population center. If for example you're lucky enough to go to Iceland or lucky enough to go to somewhere like Mount Etna, you will see often either lava flows that effectively are acting as buffers or sometimes major geoengineering features where big walls have been built um, along the lines of, of areas where you get major lava flows emanating out of a particular volcano to divert them away from population centers. So they are a hazard and over time many a town has been destroyed by a lava flow, but proper management can mean that there are a, a, a mitigated hazard. Although the degassing that's associated with long lava flows can itself be a different kind of hazard and we'll come on to that. Pyroclastic flows, this is the Mayan volcano of the Philippines, a beautiful photo back in the 80s. Um, the Philippines and Indonesia have many volcanoes and many eruptions and many pyroclastic flows and these are potentially highly lethal to anybody anywhere near that volcano. This is um, pyroclastic material traveling at hundreds of kilometers an hour. It's, it's very hot. Um, your chances of survival being caught by that are pretty much zero. And that high energy can completely wipe out a town. The, the remnants of a, of a town or a, an area that's had a pyroclastic flow through it are basically a scene of devastation. These are one of the most significant hazards close to a volcano. And they're quite hard to manage. There's no way post eruption you could manage your way out of that. The only way to deal with pyroclastic flows either by column collapse or in this case a side blast as you've got a col column collapse during eruption of a stratovolcano the only way to deal with pyroclastic flows is firstly by not building too close to a volcano secondly by understanding the hazard risk zones so or where you are likely to get around a volcano 
pyroclastic flows and also by having where it's possible the best early warning as we'll come on to early warning is a uh, movable feast depending on the nature of the volcano so often the best answer is to not build near the pyroclastic zone unfortunately for many cities in the world that's too late too many cities are close to hazardous volcanoes where pyroclastic flow hazards are a serious potential problem so some examples mount st helens so mount st helens didn't really it was a major eruption in 1980 um, it produced a uh, stratospheric column height that column was taken by the prevailing winds went all the way around the world and 17 days later reappeared over the top of mount st helens um, but it also had a major pyroclastic flow phase and that pyroclastic flow phase killed very few people because the volcano had given a reasonable amount of warning. There was lots of defamation of the volcano and people were moved away, apart from one or two people who wouldn't um, and who did sadly die. But most people had been moved out of the risk zone. But what it did do was wipe out thousands and thousands and thousands of hectares of forest land that was being grown as a cash resource and the economic impact of St Helens made it one of the most economically damaging volcanic, volcanic eruptions in history because of the amount of agricultural land it wiped out. Somewhere like Vesuvius or to the north of it the Camp of Campe Flagrade, both volcanic centres in Italy, is an interesting story because Vesuvius and the Camp of Flagrade very very close to the modern towns of um, Naples in particular but also towns to the south of Naples. Between that whole conurbation you've got close to a million people that are within various risk zones of eruptions of both Vesuvius and the Campe Flegre volcanic field. So Vesuvius when it erupted last time in 1944 had a major pyroclastic flow unit as well as the eruptive phase and that pyroclastic flow fortunately erupted out to the coast and didn't do any major damage however that coastal road is your main escape route for large parts of Naples if there's a volcanic hazard warning which is worth bearing in mind so this is the kind of thing that Vesuvius can do this is the excavated remnants of Pompeii obviously was destroyed by Vesuvius in AD 79. You had a major pyroclastic flow that moved to the south of Vesuvius and also hot ash fall as you had collapse of the column in various zones during the course of the eruption. The entire city was destroyed and much of the population didn't escape. Vesuvius and Pompeii are not very far different in terms of space to Vesuvius um, and Salerno to the south or Vesuvius and Naples to the north. So there's a significant hazard there. It's erupted many times in the past, it will erupt again. And if it erupts in the wrong way, then there is highly lethal potential. So this is the view of modern Naples from Vesuvius. If you get a major eruption, the major column collapse heading in that direction, then the risk to life is very, very high. You could also get ash fallout. So even if the pyroclastic flow didn't cause the damage, if we go back to the Bronze Age, there was an, an eruption in the Bronze Age of Vesuvius. The, the wind direction was slightly different, but it still headed over what is now modern Naples. The fallout of the, of the proximal ash that was superheated in kind of a millimeter, I'm sorry, a meter thickness of ash fall. Um, we know from excavating Bronze Age uh, towns, the whole all of the towns were, were basically wiped out again by the eruption. And that zone of Naples that was in that risk of that kind of um, ash and pyroclastic flow has at least about 250,000 people in it. There is no way now of managing your way out of that because people have built their buildings there. There's an entire city there. The only way of dealing with this is one, get as much early warning as you can and have an effective disaster plan. And one of the things that um, is a really cool thing that we often get undergraduates to look at is how effective the disaster plan for a town like Naples is compared to what we know about the eruptive history from various deposits of eruptive material around the volcano. Uh, and the answer to that, by the way, is that hazard plan is OK if you're lucky. So the last big eruption of, of Vesuvius about 500 years ago, there was about two weeks warning. But if you're unlucky, so there was very little or no warning for some um, Vesuvian eruptions, you could have no chance 
and no time to move people out of the way. So there's a very, very big risk there with modern Naples. Other risks is another classic example. So this is um, looking at the major volcanoes of Japan. Japan is in many ways one of the volcanically riskiest parts of the world to live. There are uh, many, many tens of active volcanoes that have got a long history of explosive eruptions. We're just going to look briefly at one example. We cover a lot of these in much more detail in my third year course, but we're just going to look at Mount Fuji, the iconic Mount Fuji and the conurbation of Tokyo. So this is the Hoi eruption of Mount Fuji in 1707. It's the last major eruption. And like many volcanic centers, the last big eruption is often used as the model for what will happen. And so the disaster plan, this whole region, is based on this eruption. Close to um, Mount Fuji, there were pyroclastic deposits um, and localized ash falls that were giving 300 centimeters of ash close to the volcano and any um, towns or villages in that area would be rapidly decimated, probably up to about this zone here. But as you go further away, um, this is Tokyo. Tokyo is still within the 16 to 8 to 4 centimetre ash fall zone. Now that in itself is not a, a, a significant hazard to life easily, except you think about all that ash falling, it is still a major hazard in terms of a transport hazard. There's also suffocation hazards. But actually, what is really sort of worrying is, although this is a major conurbation with high population density, if you ever take the train across this region, there are towns and villages all the way around the bottom of Fuji are within the hazard zone. There are also population centers to the north that don't feature in the hazard plan. But if you go a little bit further back in time, look at eruptions from the medieval period, there are good data sets for pyroclastic and ash fall deposits to the north of Fuji because the wind direction changes in this part of the world seasonally on the monsoon cycle. And they aren't really factored at all into the hazard plan for just that one volcano. So there's lots of work you can think about of how we might improve our risk assessment and our hazard planning for lots of volcanoes. Other types of hazards. So if we move away from pyroclastic flows and, and ash falls, um, yokolaus, um, or you know, or one kind, of, this is the Icelandic term, we're going to go into the Haas, which is what they actually are in a minute, but I just love the term Jokolauk, it, it's Icelandic for glacier run. Uh, and this is the Myrdals Jokol Glacier, or Myrdals Jokol Glacier, um, to the southern end of Iceland. Um, near it is the town of Vik, so this is Vik, um, which is for Iceland a large centre, it's a major farming community and one of the biggest towns in the whole of the south of Iceland. Um, if Murdalsjokul were to melt because the Katla volcano that sits underneath it erupts, this whole area will be covered with lahar or yokel like material. In many settings, this would be seen as a major hazard. However, Icelanders are pretty canny. And actually, the town of Vik, you can't see it easily here, but it's at a higher elevation than all of the land around it. Uh, and all this land around it, all this farming land that is heavily used by the townspeople of Vic and the villages around it, always on the high ground, is only there because of this of these Jokul Alps bringing um, material out of the volcano and deposit it around the coast. Um, sea level rise keeps eroding this land and then the volcano keeps putting it back. And this is incredibly good farmland because of the richness of the minerals you get out of these volcanic soils. So actually, unusually, the Icelanders really like the idea of um, volcanic eruptions from um, Katla. There's none that, that in their historical record have caused major damage, um, but most of them have given back some land, which is a very, very unusual setting. Normally, um, Lahars, which is the, the more general term for these kind of destabilizations of the landscape caused by melting of ice or mud flows, um, are much more dangerous. So Mount St. Helens, as I said, this is Mount St. Helens in 1980, when it erupted the major pyroclastic flows, um, took out large areas of um, land, major economic impact. And had they not cleared the, the, the towns and the villages that run along the rivers emanating away from St. Helens, there'd have been greater loss of life. And there's been subsequent eruptions of St. Helens haven't been as big, that have also produced um, uh, smaller lahars, but they've always been well managed. Again, Mount Rupahea in New Zealand always has um, erupts 
reasonably um, regularly and when it erupts there's always a lahar that again has to be managed and in Iceland we talked about yokalaps and lahars and, and how they are managed. Management from a lahar point of view is possibly you could argue easier than from a pyroclastic flow point of view it's only going to go along predominantly the river valleys once you get away from the main volcano so if you have good early warning that's important then if you're sensible you clear people away from those lahar risks and people tend not to die and, and modern volcano management in many parts of the world has become very good at that so how do we deal with them i've touched on this idea that there are ways of managing this and really it's monitoring eruptive history both of those things feed into disaster plans and i talked about building so things like setting up um uh ways of steering away things like lava from um his, from from population centers and we're going to look um at some of these in a little bit more detail one of the things we want to think about in, in terms of monitoring is how we can also utilize what i talked about earlier on which is volcanic ash so one of the things we often want to know from volcanoes is how often do they erupt we've got the historic period with some volcanoes but that's a very small snapshot of their eruptive history. And volcanic ash, while also being a hazard, can also tell us a lot about the eruptive behaviour of volcanoes in the past. And we can feed that in to our hazard management, as well as having hopes of, of monitoring and early warning. We can know if we've got a particularly risky volcano to deal with. So a few examples of this. Uh, this is partly work we've done and partly work with colleagues. Um, he is studying volcanic fallout um, in Italy as a way of thinking about how risky and how hazardous Italian volcanoes are. So the first thing you would do when working in any volcanic centre is you'd be mapping close to the volcano in quarry sites looking for pyroclastic flows and ash wall material. So this is the Brecchia Museo um, in a quarry near to Naples where you've got a series of volcanic phases. This is a pyroclastic flow phase. This is a fall phase. You've got this fine grained ash, ash phase. Um, that's what's called a coignum right? And you've got another phase here. You can kind of build up a picture of how many eruptive phases you might have. You can try and date them directly using radiometric techniques. These are often quite useful, but that doesn't give you the full picture. It's often quite difficult to work out exactly what you've got in detail in terms of numbers of eruptions close to the volcano. So we also work distally. So this is Lago Grande di Monticchio, which is a, a, a crater lake on top of the Mount Vulture volcano complex, further away from the recently active volcanic centers. So this is Monticchio. And this lake goes back 100,000 years, which is quite impressive. And because of the depth of the lake, um, there's very little living at the bottom. In fact, there's nothing living at the bottom, which means that the winter and summer layers are preserved and you get an, what we call annual laminations or annual layering. So we have an annual chronology for the eruptive history of the Italian volcanoes, because when they erupt, the ash from those volcanoes pretty much always will fall in Monticchio as one of the centers that it falls into, as the plumes are passing over the top. It's close enough to be a really good marker for Italian volcanism. You can then go further. So that tells you about really is close to the volcano. You can then also work, for example, in the Adriatic Sea. So here is some work we did a few years ago now, looking at fairly recent cores all the way down the coast of the Adriatic to try and map out the plume directions for different eruptions of these volcanoes. So do you always get the same eruptions across all of the Adriatic or do some go north, some go west, some go south? The answer is some go north, some go west, some go south. But we wouldn't know that without doing this kind of detail work. So that lets you think about the spatial um, hazard history. And you can bring those two things together. So this is a core from the Adriatic Deep. So down here, SAO 311. It's pretty much on a line from Naples to Monticchio and from the Campi Grey to Monticchio and also from Etna to Monticchio. So it's quite a useful core to sample. It goes because it tells you what's eruptive enough to go beyond the Italian mainland and into the sea. Sorry, wrong way. Um, so this is Lago Grande di Monticchio. These are all the eruptions that are known in Monticchio. So you have um, 
eruptions of both Vesuvius, for example, Mercato is Vesuvius. These are all Vesuvian eruptions. Um, then you have eruptions of the Campe Flegre, so AMS, the Ananya Montespina, um, and the Astroni. They are volcanic they're eruptions of, um, well, um, Ananya Montespina is um, Campe Flegre. Pomichi Principali is Campe Flegre, for example. Um, and we can go back in this particular core from present to about 35,000 years ago. And we can build up a detailed eruptive history, map it back into Monticchio and say, okay, sun eruptions, we don't find in SAO311. They're not very explosive. They've not got far enough to get tefra into the marine cores. Other eruptions are very, very explosive. So the AMS eruption is huge. You've got this massive amount of volcanic ash you're finding in the marine core. It gets way over into... Um, the Mediterranean, some of the Neapolitan Yellow Tuff is found thousands of kilometers from the source volcano. So you can build up a, a periodicity. How often do these volcanoes erupt? What's the likelihood of an eruption over any given period of time? And how explosive are some of these eruptions? So it's a really useful way of building up a more detailed picture. And we can do that for lots of places. This is this is a gratuitous example to show you field work in Iceland. This is Myrdal's Jokul Glacier and Katla again. And this is some field sampling we did a few years ago to look at volcanic deposits from Iceland that we're then trying to compare to volcanic ash deposits over Europe. And this time we were less interested in the eruptive frequency. You do that generally on Iceland or in the marine cores around it. We were interested in how many eruptions would spread ash right across Europe because we were thinking about this from kind of a much more ash dispersal point of view. And you can kind of guess where I'm heading. So this is um, like the the solid line are the thickish deposits of eruptions from the Katla volcano, a particular eruption called the Vede Ash. It was a very large eruption about 12,000 years ago. It's the largest eruption we know of of this volcano. And then these are deposits where we found it in lake records, particularly right across Europe. And this eruptive this volcano tends to leave eruptive material that's that's findable um, behind at least down to the Alps. It's almost certainly sent ash further south than that, but it gets smaller and smaller and we can't really find it. But it gives us an idea of how big an ash fall from a volcanic eruption from Iceland can be. It's almost certainly gone around the world as well because it's ended up in ice cores in Greenland. So that tells us a lot about what a big Icelandic eruption can do. Why are we interested in that? Well, there's lots of reasons, but from a hazards point of view, one of the reasons we're very interested, of course, is because of um, things like the AFLE eruption in 2010 that closed down all the airspace. So the AFLE eruption, um, it was, wasn't very big, actually. It was only eight kilometer column height. The really big eruptions go way higher than that. But it was a particular example of a volcano that got picked up by prevailing winds, which at that particular point were coming south out of the Arctic and it drew this ash around the North Atlantic and across Europe. And if you map that against what we find from the Vede, these are not really mapped on the terrestrial deposits, it's in loads of marine cores as well. The eruptive dispersal of the Vede, 10,121 BC, is pretty much identical to the Aefaleocal eruption. Now, that is fascinating for us because it tells us those two eruptions could do the same things. And then we can look in lots and lots and lots of younger records to see how often and how likely that kind of eruptive behaviour is. Bearing in mind that Aefaleocal did what it did, it's one of the first times in the periods of modern transport that you had this kind of eruption. So understanding this risk, this kind of risk, is about building up a story of the past. So I'm going to draw reasonably soon to a close, but I want to look at the, the last style of hazard we talked about, which is not what you think of normally as volcanic hazards, as in close to the volcano, pyroclastic flows and flame and fire, but actually volcanoes and climate. So volcanoes and climate are important from a hazard point of view. And actually, I want to end by thinking of them as also a part of our climate system. So when a volcano erupts, it degasses. Um, and any reasonably large eruption will produce um, um, a, a series of aerosols as well as ash. Uh, and in the atmosphere, they'll bond and very, very rapidly you'll get um, SO2 forming in the atmosphere, which um, bonds then with um, 
hydrogen and you'll get H2SO4 or sulfuric acid. And these form as particulates in the atmosphere. If you get a smallish eruption, something like AFLE, I'll call a column height of about eight kilometers, that's not going to enter the stratosphere. And very rapidly in a few months, that's going to be washed out. So its influence on climate isn't really there. It may influence the weather, but not necessarily climate. But the large eruptions that get into the stratosphere, you have a whole set of particulates, particularly this H2SO4, in the atmosphere, sitting there for one, two, three years, and possibly very much longer with very big eruptions, which we look at, we look at that in the third year, we call them supervolcano eruptions. Um, but in normal kind of big eruptions that we have one, two, a few times in a normal human lifetime, we get volcanic material as particulates in the upper atmosphere, and it interacts with incoming solar radiation. It does many things. It does things like heating the, it basically reflects that solar radiation and heats the upper atmosphere and that has influences on weather. But it also generally cuts down the total amount of solar radiation um, getting through that cloud and getting into the, um, the lower atmosphere. And it generally, generally, genuinely results in um, cooling of the tropospheric air mass for between one, two to three years. So large eruptions with a stratospheric, stratospheric column heights are fairly common. Generally, common heights are from about 10 to 17 kilometers, which is enough to put this material into the atmosphere. And they have been observed to have reasonably, reasonably understood effects on climate. So we're just gonna look at a very small number of these, some of the, the classic examples. And we're going to look in particular um, at the, the first that's been re, that's re, from kind of historical times that was well recorded. It's also quite devastating. So the Lackigar or the Lackey eruption of the Grimsbottom volcano in Iceland from 1783. Um, and we'll also look at El Chichon and Mount Pinatubo as two of the most recent eruptions that were large enough to have an influence on climate very briefly. So let's look at Lackey in a bit more detail. Lackey is always very exciting. It's a very, very, very um, uh, significant eruption for lots of reasons. So it erupts um, from the 8th of June, 1783, to the 7th of February, 1784. Now, um, it does lots of things. It's the second largest um, flood lava we know of in historical time. So you've got flood lava emanating for that entire period. Um, because of the amount of hydrofluoric acid, so not uh, H2SO4, this is hydrofluoric acid, and the sulfur dioxide coming out of this eruption for such a long period, it killed 50% of the livestock on Iceland and 25% of the human population. They basically were gassed. Hydrofluoric acid poisoning is particularly unpleasant. Um, it was Iceland's biggest natural disaster because of that. Um, the amount of lava erupted 14.7 kilometers cubed, a huge volume of lava erupted over that um, period from June to February. Um, there was also multiple explosive phases. Although this was a flood basalt, there's water got into the system and that water um, gives increasing viscosity to some phases of the eruption. So you get explosive phases as well. Um, and it's um, a major eruption hazard in terms of hazard but it also has an influence on climate because of the multiple phases of uh, explosive volcanism so this is the lackey fissure now so this is from a helicopter so you can see the fissure running along away from Grimswatton but you've also got a series of cone deposits where you have explosive phases from the fissure and these are vehicles for scale so you can go and visit the lackey fissure now if you are so fortunate and this is uh, ash from that eruption and then it's been coated on top by later eruptions of Grimm's water. So the 1783-84 eruption, this is a schematic. So you've got continual lava flows all the way from 1783 right through to early 1784. But as I said, you've got multiple phases of highly explosive eruptions. And each of those explosive phases fed in to volcanic cooling as recorded by some of the first attempts to, to record historical weather going back into the 18, into the 1700s. So 1783, this is the first appearance of what's called the Lackey Haze. This is the, this cloud 
of um, H2SO4 and sulfur that's moving away from Iceland and has been recorded as a haze in around Europe. Obviously on Iceland, it's killing the population and the sheep. But it's also associated with major cooling. So this is a historical record pulled together by Thordarsson self. Thor Thordarsson uh, is a classic Icelandic volcanologist. So when I showed you that picture earlier on of, of, of fieldwork on Iceland, that was Thor sat on a deck chair. He's quite an entertaining character. Um, but again, along, alongside self, Thordarsson recorded historical temperatures from uh, 1768 to 1798, and they recorded mentionings of anomalously cold summers and winters or where they had been recorded on thermometers had recorded um i mean early thermometers had recorded a temperature anomaly and as you can see 1783 84 particularly 84 and then 85 and 86 were periods of historically both cold summers and winters pinned to the timing of that eruption and we can see it on other data so this is something i pulled together there's a guy called lutabacher who has done a lot of work on climate science. He pulls a lot of data together, for example, the intergovernmental panel reports on future climate change. But the um, the Lutabaka 2006 data is a piling together of all the historical records of temperature and weather that we can find around Europe. And if you take that data and run an average through it, this is 1783, 4, 5, and we can see the Laki eruption and then a temperature anomaly, 1784, 5, but and six before we head back into normal conditions so it's a classic example of volcanoes influencing climate but it's not just lackey so a few years later there was the vp eruption of tenerife is a major explosive eruption that lasted for three months it was, it was tropospheric to stratospheric for three months long and again there's a cooling anomaly associated with that eruption in the european data now this is not global. It tends to be tropical eruptions that have more of a global impact. But in terms of European weather, both these eruptions had an influence on short term climate. So here's this mapped out. And these are quite significant. These are winter temperature, temperature anomalies. So this is minus three and minus three point five degrees below the long term average. And all across Western Europe, which took the, the main effects of this of this cooling, you had significant cooling anomalies. You also had significant cooling anomalies for the year after 1784, um, but the cooling was less significant. So the first year was the main year in this particular case. And then it comes back again, 1784, 85. We have, so that's, that's, yeah, June, July, August, that's why it's called. That's the summer cooling, sorry. So the summer cooling was significant, but not as significant. Well, that's important for crops. And then this is the winter cooling, 1784, 85. Still not as significant as the first year winter but minus two as opposed to minus 3.5 as the, as, the, as the peak of cooling. But either way, a, a winter, summer, winter of um, significant cooling from one eruption. Just to kind of draw this to a close, it's not the only eruption. It's not the only part of the world. So Indonesia, the Philippines, they have many, many eruptions. One example, the Tambora eruption of 1815, together with an eruption from about 1805, 1809, sorry, together are thought to have produced a cooling trend which peaked in 1816 which was called the year without summer across the whole of northern Europe so this is a a, a tropical eruption that's affecting the whole globe as, as opposed to just its own region um, here's the data for it so this is global average temperature reconstructions from all available data from 1816 and you can see a significant temperature anomaly that's another volcanic eruption by the way and so is that. Um, and so this is a major and very much longer lived uh, temperature anomaly ending in the year without summer. Now, the year without summer is interesting because that year, uh, Mary Shelley, along with her husband, Percy Shelley, went on what would normally call a grand tour. They went around Europe looking at the amazing sites and doing all those kind of things you do um, as as member of the landed gentry from that period. But it was the year without summer. So they had to stay indoors and write stories. And so so disturbed by both the lack of summer and the dark and, and the brooding kind of um, uh cherry red skies was, was Mary Shelley that she um, she wrote Frankenstein's monster. So um, geologists like to claim that, that Frankenstein is a direct product of a volcanic eruption. More recently, a couple of examples of, of, of recent eruptions that do the same kind of thing. This is um, this is volcanic ash falling um, at the Cuby Point Naval Air Station, which is an American air base. 
that were about 40 kilometers away from the Penatubo volcano. Um, this eruption, obviously, um, more recently in the 1990s, this is just the ash falling. There's a significant and major, again, stratospheric eruption. Most of the ash, actually, and most of the H2SO4 gets very, very rapidly taken away from the volcano and into the atmosphere with such an erosive, explosive eruption. But you can see this is Pinatubo. This is shortwave broadband emissions. So this is basically radiation coming through, coming through the atmosphere, as recorded um, at Hawaii for both Pinatubo um, during the, uh, from 1992-93, and also El Chichon, um, which is an early eruption from South America. And we can see both having a significant impact on um, solar radiation getting through into the troposphere. And a nice little aside to that, there was global cooling again associated with the 91-92 uh, eruption of Pinatubo. Um, and here's a classic example in the summer of 1992. So the ice on Hudson Bay uh, normally would melt in summer, fairly rapidly into summer. But in 92, it, after the eruption of Pinatubo, it melts much later than normal, nearly a month later than normal. And this gives more time for bears to rear their cubs and more effective feeding. Um, and Ian Sterling, who was a, a naturalist who, who helped kind of monitor the bears, says that this had a dramatic effect on the bears. They were bigger, they were heavier, they had more cubs. The cubs survived better. And the cubs that were born in that year, we call them the Pinatubo bears because many of them, so many of them survived from that particular year class. So to finish, I mean, that's volcanoes and climates kind of as a hazard, unless you're a bear. Um, but actually, volcanoes are a natural and important part of the climate system. And just to summarise it, the curve at the bottom, first of all, the grey shading is an integration of all of the best historical and in some cases tree ring based temperature reconstructions we have for the last thousand years. This big spike here is global warming. So this is CO2 as a forcing factor causing global warming. And we can see that as a human influence. But if you didn't have any other form of influence on climate, then all forcing on climate would just be humans and it would just be really a major rise in the last hundred years. But this wiggly structure of, of climate is because of volcanic forcing. So these are sulfate peaks found in Greenland ice cores we use as a proxy for major volcanic eruptions. And they map on and they cause most of this fluctuation coupled with long-term changes in solar activity. And then the red lines and the blue lines and the green lines are climate model attempts to kind of retrodict the past. We do that to test whether climate models are useful for predicting the future, which they are, and you can see they're pretty reliable compared to this past data set. But actually the main tempo of this change is volcanic activity. Volcanoes have a major influence on climate. Some volcanoes can have such an influence on climate, they can actually be a hazard in terms of things like agricultural uh, productivity. Certainly much more in the past than now, but you never know. So to finish then, volcanoes have a number of key hazards. They're really important. They're products of the different tectonic settings and also the way that certain volcanoes behave. We look at this in a lot more detail, obviously, when we get to university level. The focus is often on effects close to the volcano, pyroclastic flows and so on. And these are really important. And we do lots of cool case studies about how we need to understand them and manage them and what they mean from different perspectives, from physical science to human geography. Um, some hazards um, affect significantly wider areas through ashfall deposits. So one of the biggest dangers in the Naples region isn't pyroclastic flows, it's ash going in the wrong way, for example. Air, obviously ash can be a key aviation hazard, although um, it's also an economic hazard if it shuts down um, regions of, of air travel. We have to think about volcanoes and economics as well. And volcanoes can affect climate over short time scales and perhaps decades with very large eruptions. So thank you very much. I think I may be able to talk about this in a Q&A session next week. So thank you.